Welcome back uh, to uh, the lecture. So what were we doing? We were squeezing sequences of integers into less space. And we saw that with this variable way of doing things, we can basically squeeze any integer in an elastic way, because what do we have here? If it's a small integer, it only takes eight bits. And if it's a larger integer, it just scales magically and elegantly with the size of the integer. Sounds great, right? Because now we can encode the gaps in this way to save space. So we can adjust one parameter because I assumed eight bits for the packets, but it doesn't have to be eight. It can be four, it can be 16, uh, and so on. By the way, there's not only UTF-8, right? There's also UTF-16, UTF-32, so there's alternate ones. Okay, but let me do the same thing now with four bits, uh, the same thing. So let's just encode all of the smaller integers. So zero is just one followed by three zeros. Okay, then the first seven uh, uh, integers are easy, right? It's just in base two right there on three bits. And then I have the one that tells me that's the only packet. That's the last packet. Okay, how many bits for eight? Eight, exactly. Now I double, right? So now I have uh, three and three. So I can encode at most six bits. Zero, it's not the end. One, it's the end, right? So, and now I just continue to increase, but you see now there's this one right there that tells me we are in the eight plus range. Okay, then I continue with 16. It's still less than six bits, right? And so on and so on and so on, right? So you see here it fits on three bits. I have one packet. It fits on six bits. I have two packets and so on. And you see, the smaller gaps take less bits and the larger gaps are going to take more bits, okay? But then of course, uh, as you can imagine, you have a compromise to make, right? Because if you have, uh, for example, a lot of small gaps, but you took eight bit packets, then you still have eight bits at every small gap, right? So you can take smaller packets then to have only four bits uh, with the small gaps. The problem then is that you're wasting more space on the continuation flag because now you have more of these red uh, letters in proportion to the number of bits, right? So you have less continuation flags with larger packets, but you have larger packets for smaller gaps uh, if you have a lot of small gaps. So I, I hope you see the compromise here that we have to make between the two. Okay, I added also here the first one that takes three packets is 64 because 64 uses seven bits. And then you need one packet, one packet, one packet, zero, zero, it's not the end and one for the last one. All right, this saves us 50% roughly uh, of, uh, of space uh, uh, in, uh, in that way, just, uh, just approximately, right? To give, uh, to give, uh, to give uh, uh, an impression. Why am I saying that? Well, you, you, it, it really depends how, how, you, how you take it, but basically here, imagine compared to if I had used, um, uh, I don't know, um, 16 bits uh, in order to encode everything. 16 bits integers, uh, all the way to uh, 65,536, I think. Uh, then you see that many of them are on, are on, um, are on uh, um, eight bits right there, which is roughly half. But what the argument I'm giving to you is not mathematical. I'm just waving my hands to, to give you the intuition, right? Of course, you will need a lot of advanced magic uh, from information theory uh, to uh, to show that, but it's not an information theory lecture. I'm still, I'm still going to give you a 101 of information theory uh, a bit later. Um, but anyway, ju just an approximation, it's 50% uh, uh, less space, just waving my hands, just like that, okay. Uh, okay, so it's parameterized. So as I said, you can use very small, if you really have a lot of very small gaps, you can just use two bits, but here you're wasting half of the space with continuation flags or you can use the larger packets, then you're wasting less space with the continuation flags, but then you have 16 bits every time you have a small gap. Anyway, here's an example. Let's try to decode that one. It's a one, so I know that there's eight bits. It's a one, there's eight bits. It's a one, there's eight bits. Here, zero. It doesn't stop, it doesn't stop, it doesn't stop all the way here. Then zero again and so on, right? So you see, you can put the boundaries very easily and then decode. So you can see that now, you have the sequence of postings, more precisely the sequence of the gaps between the postings. And since we have a prefix code in there, we are able to decode and know exactly when everything stops and decode them back to the original numbers according to our, our algorithms. We've solved our problem. Now we have a variable length encoding. We are able to encode our gaps in a more efficient way and uh, gain some, some space. 
of course, there is no free lunch because even though I squeezed more into less, now I need to decode stuff. I cannot just go ahead and read the bits, right? That's not how it works. Now I need to use the CPU in order to decode, right? So again, it might take more time or I, I need more CPU. Well, in fact, in some cases, there is a free lunch actually there. Is that there is a case in which you are reading from disk and the CPU was just waiting, waiting idle. So you didn't even use the CPU, you're just reading from disk. That's the case in which squeezing actually helps without getting slower because you're using the CPU that you weren't using before, right? So, so this is kind of a free lunch, right? If you read from disk. But generally, uh, if, you, if you squeeze stuff, then you have to decode it and it takes a, a bit more of the, of the CPU. Okay, now I'm gonna repeat what I've already said, but just to make sure you understand it. If you have big packets, you don't have a lot of compression, but you have little overhead, meaning that here, the small gaps take a lot of bits but the continuation flag don't, uh, are not too costly. But if you have smaller packets, there's more compression. So the small gaps are going to be squeezed in much less bits, but there's a lot of bits to, uh, to uh, manipulate uh, because you have all these continuation flags in there. In that case, there's even several times for each um, physical byte in the CPU. So that's even extra, an extra load on the CPU to do this bitwise stuff uh, that, that you do in order to decode that, right? Okay, so you have, the compromise to do between these two uh, extremes. Can we compress even more? The answer is yes, absolutely. In fact, I can compress to the point that it's basically a magical world, right? Um, I have an encoding that I'm going to present to you that squeezes the smallest gaps. So let's take just one, a gap of one to two bits, just two bits. And that encoding, elastically and elegantly scales where you take larger integers, but it doesn't do it in, in packets, meaning that you add a packet every time. It, do it, it does it almost at the bit level. It's, it scales at the bit level. And moreover, that encoding is actually optimal no matter what the distribution of the gaps is. And this is major. Because when I told you when I was waving my hands with that right there, the reason I was waving my hands is that that actually depends on the gaps you have. You might be lucky, you might be less lucky. Of course, that might be more or less efficient. But now what I'm about to present to you, not only does it do it bitwise with only two bits for the smallest gaps, but on top of that, it's optimal no matter what the distribution. Of course, I'm going to explain to you what I mean with optimal, right? But let's do it a bit later. And first, I want to introduce you to that encoding, bitwise. It's called the gamma encoding because of uh, uh, its uh, uh, um, Elias is the name of the researcher who invented it and he called it the gamma uh, encoding. Peter Elias, even I forgot his first name. Uh, so this is a researcher from MIT who uh, contributed this beautiful encoding. Okay, but now uh, I am going to add even more of a cliffhanger and, 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 and uh, make you patiently wait for the, the gamma encoding because I have a prerequisite for the gamma encoding that I need to show you before the gamma encoding. This is something used by the gamma encoding. This encoding, is called the unary code. What is the unary code? You will love it. It's also called the thermometer code, but you will instantly understand why. In order to encode the number 12, I encode 12 times the bit one, 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 10 times, and then I put a zero. This is called the unary code. Why thermometer? Because it's basically literally a thermometer, right? So the, it's basically as long in here, in size, in number of bits, as the integer that you're encoding, right? So this is how, how you remember it as a thermometer. All right, 12 ones followed by zero mean that it's a 12. Uh, and uh, yeah, the zero marks the end. So this is what it is for the, the smaller integers. So you see zero for zero, one zero for one and so on. So you see, you can guess actually that it's quite inefficient when you start, when you have to store uh, one billion, for example, that's take, gonna take one gigabyte just to encode that number. But anyway, that's uh, the thermometer encoding and it just linearly scales in the number of bits with uh, what you want to uh, encode. So this is the unary code. Now you immediately notice, that is that a prefix code? Yes, absolutely, it's a prefix code. All you need to do is look for the zeros, right? So every time you have a zero, you just count the ones in between, right? So now you know exactly that this is eight, five, 14 and so on. So we could of course say, okay, let's go ahead and encode our posting list using the thermometer or the unary encoding. Uh, I can tell you it's going to be a catastrophe 
that is going to basically use all of your disk space to store very little. But that's because we are not going to actually use it. This is only something I need for the gamma code, right? Okay, so that's the unary encoding. But I hope you understand that it's a prefix code and that you can very unambiguously reconstruct uh, the integers uh, like this. Okay, now that I have my thermometer code or my unary code, here is, ladies and gentlemen, the gamma code. Let's encode the number 90. Okay, first, that's also something you do almost spontaneously, let's put it in base two, right? So 19 is in base two is this thing right there, 10011, 16 plus two plus one. Okay, now what do I do? Well, I'm going to cut the one that is in front. Do we have a question? Uh, we have a comment. Would that rather be a suffix code or maybe there is a question? Oh, the terminology. Well, I don't actually know why it's called a prefix code. It's just called a prefix code. So a prefix code is just the name that you give in order to say that you never have one that is the prefix or an, of another. Well, of course, it also means that there is also no suffix, no one that is the suffix or, uh, oh no, what am I telling you? No, no, that's not true. Um, so it's called a prefix code. Let me rewind. I'm improvising here. When you have an encoding such that two potential uh, encodings of two different integers are never ever a prefix of one another, then it's called a prefix code. Um, now you're asking if it could be called a suffix code instead, probably because you have a different a different intuition here um, that I'm trying to understand. Is it because you add, you add the zero at the end, the suffix code? Yeah, all right. I, I, see, I see where this is coming from. So yes, you, you, if you want to call it suffix code, it's just that the terminology is basically called prefix code. But for a moment, you had me believe that it was actually equivalent also with suffix, but no, it's, uh, it really has to see uh, to be prefix. All right. You see what happens when I improvise in the middle of a, of a lecture because I, 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 pre I spend a lot of time preparing everything I'm telling you, even though of course I speak spontaneously, but sometimes you also have to, uh, to answer live to, uh, to questions uh, that are coming live. All right, but this is what I'm here for. Okay, so 19, encoding is base two, 10011, and then you have the, uh, the, 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 the one, well, it's only, always going to be a one, right? Uh, when you start, the, the, the first bit that you have, if you write it in base two, uh, is not going to be a zero. It's the same in base 10. You, you never start a number with a zero, right? Um, except zero itself. Okay, so let me put aside this one because this is actually not information I'm gonna be missing. I basically know the one is always there, right? So, so let me just drop it. And then what I'm gonna do is put the extra bits, except the leading one, and then I'm going to be mirroring the, the thing like this, but as ones. So I'm going to put a zero right there and then as many ones as there are bits there. So there are four bits, four ones, right? And the zero. So this is what I get and then I just paste it together. So this is the gamma encoding of 90, right? This is it. It's always going to be an odd number of bits, right? Plenty of ones followed by a zero followed by the binary encoding without the leading one, gamma encoding. Okay, let's do it for the first integers. So first, zero, one, two, three. Two binary, that's going to be it. Then binary without a leading one uh, here, that doesn't work. Here I have zero and here I have one. The length of, the, of, the, of, of this, here it's zero and here it's one. The unary encoding, so you see, because I didn't tell you, right? But this here is in fact the unary encoding of the length of that, right? So this is why I presented to you the unary encoding. All right, so this is the unary encoding of the length, one zero in that case, and here it doesn't exist. So, okay, so that means in this case, where I have one zero zero, which is the encoding of two, and one zero one, which is the encoding of three. Now we have a problem with the bootstrap <laughs> with zero and one. It means that here we have to come up with something uh, when in fact one can be encoded. It's even better than what I told you. I just didn't remember. It's one single bit to encode, encode one. Just put a zero in there and zero, just zero alone is the encoding of one. And then two is encoded as zero, one, zero, zero, three is encoded as one, zero, one and so on. Okay, let's continue. 
four, five, six, seven. This is the representation in base two. Here I stripped the leading one. Now it's a length of two. The unary or thermometer encoding of two is zero, one, one, zero, because two ones. And now I put my one, one, zero followed by the binary representation without the leading one. So these are the subsequent ones. Now I have five bits in there. Now I continue eight to 15. Now uh, the representation without the leading one have a, length, have a length of three. So now I have a thermometer encoding with three ones and then they're come, right? And then I continue, continue, continue. So you see, we have the same pattern here that we squeeze into just one bit, the representation of one, and then we grow and grow and grow and grow elastically, but I don't even have the eight bit packets anymore, right? It's, it's basically smoothless, smooth now, the, uh, the, um, uh, the, 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 the way that it scales, right? With the integers, all right? So this is the gamma encoding, right? You take the binary representation, you drop the leading one, and you put as many ones as there are bits in there, plus a zero in the middle, and there you get your gamma encoding. Right. So it's a variable length encoding, obviously. It starts with one for the integer one, then it uh, scales. It's a prefix encoding. Yes, absolutely. It's a prefix encoding because all you need to know to know where it stops is look at the number of ones. Right. You just look for the number of ones, wait for the first zero, and then you know that you need to read that many more bits. Right. And it's a universal encoding, but I'm coming back on that. The universal encoding, it means that it's optimal no matter what the distribution of the gaps is. All right. Um, okay, so I hope it's clear now that the gamma code is a variable length encoding and that it's a prefix code. So now I'm going to go in the universal encoding. Now you need to fasten your seat belt because this is going to involve a bit more theory and entropy and so on and so on. So are you following? Until now, who is following? You raise your hand. Everyone seems to be following. This is great. Okay, perfect. So now is the moment to focus because there's going to be a bit more theory or more, more heavy, more heavy theory. Um, I made a statement. I said the gamma encoding is universal in the sense that it's optimal in terms of number of bits, given any distribution of the input, any distribution of the gaps. This is a very strong statement. How do we quantify the, the, the optimality of encoding information? Well, it turns out that somebody called Shannon, uh, uh, Claude Shannon, I think, uh, came up with a concept uh, that is defined on a probability distribution. So it's basically a measure on, on a set probability distribution. Uh, and the entropy of that probability distribution is basically the number of bits that it would take on average to, uh, to encode uh, the, 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 the members of the set, in which you have the probability distribution. So, if you have a probability distribution on integers, so imagine a magic box that just distributes integers to you. 16 is just a randomly drawn integer. Uh, then what is the smallest average number of bits that you can possibly achieve? This is achieved with the Shannon entropy, right? So you compress integers. Lossless means you don't lose information. You can retrieve uh, via this number of bits, you can retrieve 60. And what's going on there in that case is that we pass the gamma encoding of 60 right in there through that channel and we really compress it and this is optimal. All right, so a few words on entropy. What is entropy? How is it defined? Well, it's called H, the, the function entropy. And let's pick a random variable, right? So we have a random variable. The values of that are integers, right? And there is some probability distribution on the random variables. I will come back to a probability 101 in a few weeks when we look at probabilistic information retrieval, but now I assume the, you know, the basic of probabilities, right? So we have a, a random variable X that is passed to H. It's not the value of X that is passed. It's X itself that is passed. It's really the random variable here that I'm passing. And it is actually the expected value of i of x, except that now with two i, I'm passing the actual value of x. Okay, let me explain. So i is an amount of information, which is a, a, a number of bits, right? So in, in practice, uh, it's taken as minus the log of the probability, right? So um, what happens is that this, uh, this function is going to take very, very high values for a rare occurrence. So it's basically a value that has no probability happens very rarely. So if you see it, that's a lot of information, right? Because it happens rarely. But if you see something happen that has a probability of almost one, 
like the sun is uh, rising today, well, of course, the sun is rising today. That happens every day, right? So there is no information in that, right? Uh, but if there is a storm going on right now, which is the case with Diego, then uh, th th this is obviously a rarer event. So there is more information. So the quantity of information, you can make it a function of the probability, right? Very few, very little information with the high probability and more information with the low one. What you are looking at is basically the expected value of that amount of information, right? Be careful with the notation. I'm coming back on that. This X right there is the random variable, right? So it's the probability associated with the random variable. This X right there is going to be an instantiation of that random variable. So it's the value of X. We apply a function to X. And if you apply a function to a random variable, you get again a random variable. And then you compute the expected value. But this is very different here that the value here is the actual random variable. Here, what is passed to P of X is the actual value of the random variable. So just be careful with the notations to make sure you understand that, right? So H is a function of the random variable itself. Okay, so now if you write that down, the expected value is just a weighted sum with the probabilities of I of X. And now you see what I mean, what I meant earlier. What you pass in there is the actual value, small x of the random variable that you pass to the probability, but you iterate uh, on, the, on the possible values. All right. And this magic formula here, the sum of minus p log p, actually is called the Shannon entropy. Whatever probability distribution I give you, you can, you can compute uh, the Shannon entropy of that distribution. Example, deterministic distribution, it's always going to be zero, the integer that we look at, right? In that case, uh, I can compute the entropy as one probability of one times minus log of one, which is zero. So the entropy here is zero. Well, that's what I told you, the sun is rising every day. So if I have something with a probability of one, there is zero information in there. Now let's take a binomial distribution. One quarter of chance that zero happens, half of a chance that one happens, and one quarter of a chance that two happens. Well, in that case, these are my probabilities, one quarter, one half, one quarter. Now, minus log of that, so it's two because that's one quarter, one divided by two to the power of two. Here it's one because that's uh, one divided by two to the power of one, and here it's two, right? Okay. So now I multiply this, right? And I sum. This is my sum over um, minus p log p, right? So here I get an entropy of 1.5. Again, I repeat, what is this 1.5? It's the entropy of this, all of that, the entire distribution has the entropy 1.5, not a value of that. The entire distribution as a whole has the entropy 1.5. Uniform distribution, one quarter each. Well, then minus log P is two, and then I do the multiplications right there and some. This as a whole, the uniform distribution as a whole has the entropy two. It's an actual number. All right. Now another one, the geometric distribution. It's basically one over two to the power of n, right? So every time it gets halves. So now I, I write all the probabilities, minus log of the probability, I multiply pairwise, and then I add, I have an entropy of two, right? That's interesting because the uniform distribution here actually has the same entropy as the geometric distribution. It means that you can, on an average of two bits, encode the distribution of integer that follows this distribution. So it means that every other number is going to be zero, Every fourth number is one, every eighth number is two, and so on and so on. Okay, so you follow me? This as a whole, the entire distribution as a whole has the entropy two. Okay, now let's stop looking at entropies. Now I'm looking at the average length. Well, you know how to compute an average value, it's an expected value with probabilities, right? So we have the probabilities, we have the length of the encoding of these integers, right? So if you use a variable length encoding on eight bits, then everything here is uh, eight bits. So I picked the geometric distribution. I only computed the first integers, right? Of course, at some point it's going to get 16, right? But look what happens here. Uh, if I multiply and so on and so on, basically it converges to something like 8.000. Actually, what, what comes is so negligible after this that you can almost ignore it. So you have an, uh, sorry, an average, I hope I didn't say entropy, I'm not talking about the entropy, I'm talking about the average length. So the length of the uh, 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 integer in average is going to be eight. Be careful, this is not like HL here, 
takes an integer as a parameter, not a random variable. So what I'm passing here is one possible value of x I'm passing to f, right? And then, then I'm computing the expected value of the length of that integer. Okay, and then, so if I apply this expected value formula, then I get eight. Now, um, what am I doing? Yes, if I take a different encoding, so here I put the variable byte encoding eight bits, and I got an average length of eight. It means that on average, I need eight uh, bits to encode every integer. Well, that's not very surprising, right? Because I'm basically encoding everything on eight bits and those that need more are actually negligible. So it's not really surprising. But let's look at the gamma encoding because I was saying it's better. Why is that better? Well, let's compute the average length of the gamma encoding, right? So the gamma encoding of, uh, 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 here I offset it by one, right? Because zero doesn't have one. So I'm just offsetting everything by one. So the first, it's just a zero, so a length of one. Then we saw that the next one, which is one zero and one one have a length of three. Then they have a length of five. It's always an, an odd length, right? For the gamma encoding, right? So, okay, so I'm writing down my length right there of the gamma encoding, and I'm computing my expected value by computing the weighted average with the probabilities, which I'm doing explicitly right there. So I just multiply this and sum. So the expected value of the length of my encoding is 2.26666. Okay, now that's better, right? Because I had eight if I was using the variable byte encoding. Now on average, I'm using 2.3 to be generous, 2.3 bits for every number. That's actually first great and better than the variable byte encoding if I'm using that specific distribution, right? Because I, I, I use the geometric distribution. So I assume here that this is how my gaps are distributed in my index, right? So if I assume that the gaps are distributed like that, then the average length is 2.2. Okay, that's not optimal, why? Because I know that the entropy of the uh, geometric distribution uh, is actually two, right? Remember, I computed an entropy of two. It means that there exists somewhere a way to encode my numbers in such a way that if they distribute like that, I'm using two bits. So basically we know this is bad, variable length by not going such a good job. This is much better, but not quite two. So we are not there yet. Now I'm going to say, to say something extremely surprising Ladies and gentlemen, the optimal encoding for a geometric distribution is the thermometer encoding, the one that was absolutely awful. Well, it turns out that if the data happens to be distributed like that, it's optimal, right? And this is a quite surprising result, but you can actually do it if the length is actually equal to the integer, which is extremely inefficient. Well, if you do compute the average of that, it's basically just uh, the sum of that, it's exactly two. It converges, it's a, a series that converges to two. So the very surprising thing is the thermometer encoding, which you might have thought is actually very inefficient, which is often is, if the data happens to be distributed geometrically, then it's optimal. But then is the thermometer encoding better than the gamma encoding? No, of course not. Why? Because in practice, my data is not always distributed like that, right? So, so in practice, the data can be distributed in many, many ways. So my unary encoding excels at the geometric distribution. It's actually the optimal uh, encoding. Uh, but if I change the distribution, uh, I take another geometric distribution, like in that case uh, uh, with a different coefficient here. So let's say one quarter of, instead of one half. Then this is true that the unary encoding is always going to be optimal in the sense that the average length of the thermometer encoding matches the entropy for any geometric distribution. But if you take another distribution, this is where the catastrophe happens. Let's assume I have now um, a uniform distribution of the data and I'm computing the average length of this thermometer encoding over there. Now it's one quarter, one quarter, one quarter, one quarter with this length. Now you see, I have 2.5. This is more than the entropy. The entropy was actually two in this case. You, you can encode this on two bits, right? If you have four possible integers with a probability each of one four, two bits is optimal. So you see that now the unary encoding isn't so good anymore for that different distribution. In fact, if now you take a distribution uniform across all numbers between zero and a billion, meaning that your gaps are coming completely randomly and uniformly distributed, but they can take super huge values, then the average length of my unary encoding is absolutely awful because now the average length is basically half a billion. 
I'm using half a billion bits for every single integer I'm encoding. So to summarize, what's happening right there is that many encodings, in particular the unary encoding, are optimal if the data is distributed in a certain way. If the data is not distributed in that way, then it's not going to perform well. So there is an assumption on the data in there. But, and this is the power of the gamma encoding, what is extraordinary with the gamma encoding is that no matter what distribution you take, uniform, geometric, binomial, any distribution, any of it, I can guarantee you this is proven that the average length of the gamma encoding is always within a factor of three of the entropy. And this is a massive result. It means that you can distribute, you can index any collection you want. The gaps can be in any distribution you want with a, with a skew towards smaller gaps, with a skew towards larger gaps. You don't care. The average length that it takes to encode your gaps, your possible lists using the gamma encoding is always optimal within a factor of three of the entropy. This is what I wanted to tell you about that. Within a factor of three, all right. So unary encoding, only good for geometric distribution. It's a very specific case and absolutely awful for pretty much anything else. Gamma encoding might not be perfect and you know exactly matching the entropy, but it's within a factor of three for any distribution of your data. Just one constant factor from being optimal. All right. Okay. Did you get that? I, now that, that, that was basically the tricky part where I was basically uh, putting you in information theory and entropy and so on. So did that scare you or who, who understood what I've been telling you? Mm, yeah, people seem to have understood the core ideas. That okay. You... All right. Okay, I, I, I told you this was slightly more complex than the rest, right? So if you understood that, that's absolutely great. We, what we're really doing here is just looking at how good we are compressing. In order to look for how good we are compressing, we need to look at the average length of every gap that we're putting on our disk, right? So this is why, since information theory tells us that the entropy of the distribution of the gaps is optimal, we are trying to find an encoding that is as close as possible to the entropy and it turns out we have one, it is the gamma encoding. The gamma encoding is optimal for any distribution within a factor of three. Well, we have a question from the chat. Yeah. Can we use the computed distribution on the fly? Oh, the distribution. Well, you don't need to. Let me also explain that. What you do when you build the index using a compression technique is all you do is you get the gap you encode it with the gamma algorithm and store it. That's it. Or you, to decode it, you read from the disk uh, a gamma encoding and you decode it to an integer. And that's it. You don't need a distribution for that. It's just a very simple deterministic algorithm that tells you how to encode and decode uh, the gamma encoding. You don't need to know about the distribution. Why did I spend 10 minutes talking to you about distribution? Because we were doing theory. We were just doing the theory of what is theoretically optimal. And in understand the concept of theoretically optimal, you need to think about the distribution. But the distribution is only in our minds. It's only in our brains. It's not actually something we are going to compute, right? But since we did all of that theory and we have that result about the gamma encoding, what I can tell you is that no matter what your distribution is, and you don't even need to bother about what the distribution is, you know that you are optimal within a factor of three from what anybody else on earth, any genius on the earth could invent, they will not be able to improve by more than a factor of three. That's what I can tell you. It's already optimal in that sense. But does it make sense? All right, so now I assume you would be able to implement uh, the, the conversion of a posting list that you can convert it to a sequence of gamma encoding. You will do it in the exercises, probably also in the quiz, and uh, then you need to be familiar with that. Right? The theory, well, that was just in order to give you a bit of theory, but the emphasis right there is really more on the actual gamma algorithm and the implementation of the gamma encoding and decoding. Right? If you want to learn more about entropy and you know the, the, the theory of all of that, there's plenty of information theory lectures with the Shannon entropy and uh, 
uh, at ETH, right? So you can also take that. All right. Any question? Yes. Um, but once we know the distribution of the world by web, uh, then we could adapt and do better. Is the distribution yeah. 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 change that quickly? Absolutely. Yes. The answer is yes. If you do know the distribution, then you can, instead of the gamma encoding, find an encoding that is better for this very specific distribution. But it's more effort because first you need to know the distribution and second you need to find an encoding that is optimal to that distribution. Right? So th this is a constraint. What are you getting for the gamma encoding? What you're getting is that you don't even need to worry about the distribution because no matter what it is, it's optimal. So the, the, the benefit of the gamma encoding is you don't care about the distribution. That's the beauty of it. Right. But you're absolutely right. If you do know the distribution, then you can find something that is even closer than by a factor of three for this very specific distribution. Right? Okay. Uh, okay. So I'm almost, uh, where am I here? Oh yeah, I'm, I'm almost done uh, actually with what I want to show you. I, I have a few calculations more to show you, but this is really, it's okay if you basically are not more, more following because the details are in the book if you want to, to, to see more in details. Now we are going to evaluate basically in the concrete case of, uh, of, uh, of, our, of, of the postings, because to, to, let's go back to your question. You were asking, what if we know the distributions? Well, we kind of know it, right? Because this is SIP's law, right? So why don't we take SIP's law and try to calculate how we are doing with the gamma encoding, right? So we, we, we can actually do that. Okay. So we take the renormalized frequency, which is basically the one over N. So I, I told you it's a one over N uh, rule. Now I'm renormalizing with some constant in such a way that it sums to one. Do not jump to the ceiling. It's not an infinite sum. It's a sum about a finite number of terms. Of course, if there was an infinite number of terms that wouldn't even be renormalizable, right? But with a finite sum, a finite number of terms, I can renormalize that by making sure that I divide everything by the same factor such that it sums to one, right? Such a way that it sums to one. This is how I pick C. M is the number of terms. All right. So how many terms do I have per document? Well, I need to multiply that with the document length, right? So this is basically, you can see it as the probability that this is the next term, C over the rank, times the document length. That's the average number of terms in every document. So again, okay, you're going to use letters. So L for the size of a document, number of terms, and times C, the renormalization constant over the rank. Okay, now let's apply this to the, to the dictionary, right? So now I have all my terms. I'm sorting them by decreasing frequency. So I'm starting with the stop words and the very frequent terms with very long posting list, and then I have uh, decreasing sizes of posting lists. All right. So how many postings do I have uh, uh, for any document? Well, uh, in total, sorry, for the entire index, well, it's the number of documents times the number of occurrence per document, right? So the number of postings is N, the number of documents, times the length of a document, times C, divided by the rank. So now let me take blocks to simplify the calculation in, in uh, the, the, sorry, blocks of terms of length LC. The reason I'm doing that is just because the formula is going to simplify. So it means that I'm taking the first LC ranks, then the next two LC ranks, the next LC ranks, meaning that this one has rank two LC, then the next LC terms, meaning that now I have the rank three LC and so on and so on. All right. Now I'm going to approximate the length of a posting list for every block. So I'm going, I'm going to approximate here, then I'm going to approximate there, then I'm going to approximate there. Okay. So I have here n, uh, n postings to n minus, uh, sorry, uh, my, uh, my head is, going to, is starting to slow down a little bit. I have here an average of n postings, here n over two postings, here n over three postings. Um, why? Because I'm multiplying this with the, the size uh, here. I have here the number of postings for a given rank is n LC divided by rank. I am at rank LC right there. So I can replace rank with LC and that cancels out and that gives, that gives me N, right? So on average here, I have N postings. Then the next rank here, rank two LC, 
I can put it at SIP slow. So I replace the rank with two LC. That simplifies LC and LC cancels out. So now I have N over two, right? So this is N over two. Now I put my new rank here, three LC, three LC, that the LC again goes away. I only have the three that is left, N over three. So you see, this is the reason I created the blocks because now I have a simple number of average uh, number of postings for every block, right? Okay, these are approximations. Now, if I know the number of postings, that tells me something about the gaps. Because if I have N over J, so let's call it J, N over J postings in the J group, if I have N over J posting, what is my average gap in there? Can anybody tell me the average gap size? It's J, right? If I have in total, the, my integers go from one to N, N is the number of documents. If I have N over J postings, on average, I'm going to have, have gaps of size J, right? I have N min over J gaps of size J on average. Is there a question? Divided by, by the documents. Oh yeah, you're basically giving the same answer, right? So yes, uh, that, that, that's pretty much the idea because you have N, which is the number of documents and you need to, to divide N by this and you get J, exactly. I suppose this is what you, what you, what you said. All right, so now in my N postings right there is basically the stop words where they have almost all the documents in there. So the gap is one. The gamma encoding is going to be simple. That's my, my zero, right? One is encoded with zero. Here, the average gap is two. You, need, you know that this needs three bits right there. For three, it also needs three bits, right? So basically, this is how it goes, right? So here, I have an average gap of one, an average gap of two, an average gap of three, and so on and so on. So what I can do then at, at my group J with N over J postings with the gap J is that I can use the length of my gamma encoding. And you probably notice that you can easily find a formula for a gamma encoding. It's the log of the number, the size that it would take in base two, but times two, right? Because every time you need to mirror it with all the ones on the left. So it's roughly twice the log plus one for the zero in the middle, right? So this is what we put in there. And then it becomes more complex. So it's okay, basically that's, uh, that's what I get in the end. This is just to give you the essence of how you can estimate uh, the, the given the, uh, the, 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 the size of the gamma encoding, what it takes on, uh, on um, and then index with tip so all right but i think now it's the easter break i i need to uh, to now uh, uh, free you from uh, from all the the uh, all, all these theories so let's finish on how we did basically compressing with our encoding with uncompressed variable byte gamma encoding you see this is a factor of four that we get that's really awesome right we we, we really did a good job right but this is my last slide I know it was a bit more complex. It was a bit of compression. I probably lost some of you when I started talking about entropy and optimality, but don't worry, there is a book there. Chapter five, index compression covers pretty much the same thing. You can take the time to read it and read and read and read and read. And then if you have any questions, then you can come back to us on Mattermost uh, or, uh, or uh, per email or, you know, and of course there will be the exercises with plenty of encodings of variable length, gamma, unary, and so on, on plenty of integers. So you'll have a lot to exercise. And again, the focus here is on knowing the encodings. How do I encode? What is the algorithm for encoding and decoding? There will probably be exam questions where we give you integers, ask for the encodings, we give you encodings, ask for the integers, you know, that sort of things. All right, that's it. Now you can have two weeks of uh, break because there's uh, uh, actually almost uh, three because there's no lecture next Friday. There's no lecture the Friday after that. So it's actually going to be in three weeks. So you have plenty of time to digest everything that I have thrown at you uh, um, today in last week. All right. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dan, for moderating uh, uh, today's lecture. And uh, we are here to answer any questions you have. Enjoy the exercises. Have a good weekend. Have a good Easter break. And see you in three weeks for the continuation of the lecture. Thank you very much. <laughs>